understanding balance sheets. This reading has various small small theory points. So as far as exams is concerned, you need to know how to treat different items in US GAAP and IFRS and you need to know the smaller details. Okay, so your notes are going to be important for this reading. Learning outcome A, which is about elements of balance sheet. So this is the fashion in which we can prepare balance sheet, horizontal or vertical. It would be broken down into two parts. By convention in India, we write equities and liability on the left and assets on the right. Most of the countries do it the other way around where they write assets on the left and they write equity and liability on the right. So typically this section of balance sheet is equity, the top section, this section is your liability and then this section is your entire assets. What we say is that total of this side and total of this side should always be same and with that intuition we can make an equation. We can say equity of a firm plus the liability should be equal to total assets of the firm. Are we okay with this? Now typically this side of the balance sheet you should think of this as what are the sources through which an organization has been able to generate funds. So an organization will generate fund either by investing, the promoters will invest their own money or they will take money from outsiders in the form of debt. And this portion, think of this as how that money is being put to use. So this is your application of funds. And of course, in whatever sources you have, that should always match with the application. So when you prepare balance sheet in a vertical fashion, that's precisely what you do. You start with the sources of funds and you list down what is the equity and what are the liabilities. You take a total and then you start with application of funds, which is essentially all your assets. And then you take a total. And of course, this total should match with this total. Are we okay here? So learning outcome B, this is about uses and limitations of balance sheet. So let's think of the uses first. Typically we can use balance sheet to gauge different aspects of business of a firm. Most importantly, we can understand what is the liquidity of the business and we can also look at what is the solvency of the business. Now what would be liquidity? So you typically look at ratios like current ratio, current ratio is calculated as current assets divided by current liability or you can look at asset test ratio also called as quick ratio which would be current assets minus inventory divided by current liability or we can also look at cash ratio which would be cash divided by current liability. So if you want to see, <coughs> for example, uh, you're a manufacturer of certain goods, a new customer has approached you who intends to make a purchase, but is expecting a credit of two months. So you want to decide whether this new customer will he be able to pay you back in two months. So one of the criteria on which you take that decision, you would request him for his balance sheet of the last few years and you will calculate his liquidity ratio. And if you found liquidity to be sufficient on the balance sheet, you might extend him the credit because you know that if required, he can generate cash through business and pay you back. Understood? Then solvency ratio. This is more of a long term nature where you want to figure out whether the firm will be able to sustain in the business for a longer period of time. So there are multiple ratios here. Two most popular ratios are the first one is financial leverage. Okay, do not confuse this with degree of financial leverage. So when you say degree, that's a different number. When you just say financial leverage, that's a different number. The ratio here that we look at is total of the assets divided by total of equity. Now we know that these assets are in a way made of debt plus equity. So of course, if a firm has no debt, 
if a firm has no debt do you agree that financial leverage would be one because essentially it would come out to be equity by equity but of course if it has larger debt then you will expect financial leverage ratio to be substantially greater than one so in a way this ratio gives you an indication of that owners have invested maybe only 10 in the business but they have acquired assets worth 50 so compared to their own equity the valuation of or the assets of the business is five times that is your financial leverage is that making sense and the next ratio here is debt equity debt divided by equity which in any ways give you a same sort of a idea or indication now linking this a little bit with the uh, equity valuation you would later on learn a type of investors who would be called as value investors okay so one of the criteria on which these people select stock it's it's a type of it's an investment philosophy so one of the criteria for value investors to select stock they look at companies which have very low financial leverage ratio and very low debt to equity ratio are you following this so both liquidity as well as solvency these ratios you can directly find out from the balance sheets itself now another thing which we can find out from the balance sheet is ability to make distribution to shareholders so you assuming you've written the first part there are two companies here so total of the assets are let us say 1000 which means total on this side will also be 1000 we know that this portion is equity which is typically made of multiple parts so first is common shares common shares is simply calculated as face value into number of shares at times we call this is equity share capital so let us say this is about 100 then a part of equity is also called retained earnings so every year firm will earn profit and it will accumulate that profit whatever profit it decides not to pay in the form of dividend it will accumulate that on the balance sheet so maybe retained earnings here is 900 this firm which has same size of assets is ha it has common shares of 100 retained earnings of maybe another 100 and then it has debt of 800 are we okay now on an average let us say these firms have been generating profit of about 100 every year and on an average their capex requirement on an average their capex requirement is another 80 or 90 per annum so what does it mean now observe carefully every year profit generated is 100 every year the firm needs to invest amount into fixed assets that's about 80 so which means most of the firm whatever profit they will generate they might end up investing that profit into their capex requirement however the second firm it is sitting on a large amount of retained earnings compared to the first firm and therefore in case if firm decides to pay dividend if it de decides to pay dividend it can still do that because whatever capex requirement it can fund from its retained earnings are you following what i'm trying to say so which means when you look at the balance sheet it gives you a sense of how much distribution company can make to the shareholder so you can read finer numbers like capex requirement and you can read numbers like the retained earnings on the equity section any question you'd like to ask so yeah good question a lot of people think that retained earnings or accumulated earnings so people think of it as some room in a company where they stack up the cash so it doesn't work that way what it simply means is you made profit of 100 you decided not to pay that to the shareholders you put that onto your retained earnings so you what do you do with that additional cash maybe it remains in cash maybe it goes in your working capital maybe it goes in your investments maybe it goes in your fixed assets anywhere but the profits that the firm has reinvested in the business we simply call that as retained earnings and legally firms which have larger retained earnings have more bandwidth to pay dividend the question he asked will retained earning go more into current assets and 
less of fixed assets no it could be either ways <laughs> so a firm might make a strategy that whatever profit they make about 60% of that profit they will use for funding their future capital requirement capex requirement so which means when you're funding your capex from your profit essentially you're putting that money into fixed assets and maybe some part of working capital will also be funded by existing profit now we're discussing limitations of balance sheet so i think the first limitation is measurement basis measurement base now what does it mean imagine we have a balance sheet and on this balance sheet we have different assets okay so let me make a list of those assets so we have a goodwill all of you appreciate what goodwill is then we have let us say certain plant 1 okay we have plant 2 then we have investment 1 we have investment 2 then we have pp for sale and then we have current assets now typically goodwill on your balance sheet would be shown at the acquired cost okay the reason being we do not charge amortization on goodwill so this is acquired cost adjusted for impairment if any adjusted for impairment so impairment is kind of a one time deduction so it's like one company acquires other company it pays a larger amount of sum to acquire whatever excess money it pays that is shown as a goodwill but every year it will test whether that goodwill valuation is still intact or the value has reduced in the market if yes then it will charge a impairment so this asset we are looking at acquired cost cost means acquired cost means the cost at which you purchase the asset less adjusted for impairment typically plans you would see on the balance sheet you would see them at acquisition cost the price at which you purchase them minus accumulated depreciation okay so you would reduce depreciation from these every year so acquisition cost minus accumulated depreciation some investment on your books you might see them at cost okay so once we learn towards the later part of this learning outcome you would realize that some of the investment are shown at amortized cost for simplicity i'm just saying cost cost is same as acquisition price the price at which you purchase them some investment you would see them at fair value fair value is equivalent to market value then again this investment you might see at fair value most of the current assets you would see them at cost or fair value whichever is lower okay the rule doesn't apply to all the current assets but most of them so now think of it you're looking at balance sheet of a company and you know that there is no consistency in at what price which asset is shown they are neither shown at market value nor not all of them are shown at market value or not all of them are shown at book value every asset is shown at a different value depending on the accounting standards so goodwill is shown at acquired cost plants are shown at acquisition cost minus accumulated depreciation some of the investments at fair value some of the investment at cost so this is one of the disadvantage if you are a equity research analyst and if you want to find out market value of all the assets then you would keep on guessing whether the value on the balance sheet is this really a market value or are these really the market value is this the market value or is this the market value so this is being described as one of the limitation of balance sheet and of course another major limitation is there might be some assets okay which might not come on the balance sheet at all okay so there might be certain type of assets that the firm has generated but they would not come on the balance sheet think of the r and d expense that the firm has done in us gap environment 
Okay, so US GAAP does not allow you to capitalize research and development expenditure. So you do a research, you build some sort of a prototype. That prototype is valuable in the market, but because of accounting standards, you would not be able to bring it on the balance sheet. Are you following this? Or think of uh, internally generated brand or internally generated goodwill. This never comes on the balance sheet. For example, you start your own company and uh, your company becomes very popular. It has a very strong goodwill in the market. That goodwill will never come on your own financial. It might come on financial of someone else when they take over your company. But your self-generated goodwill will not come on the balance sheet. Are you following this? And then a lot of liabilities that firm might not accept or might not calculate properly. So one of them could be pension liability. Okay, or other liability towards employees or something like a contingent claim which firm has chosen to show as a contingent claim but it has materialized to be a true liability. So it is quite possible that certain liabilities and certain assets might not come on your balance sheet. So when you split a company into multiple parts, this is internal restructuring, can you recognize the goodwill? No. It can, it can be recognized only in a sale of business transaction. So if your company is being acquired by some other company at a better valuation, then the goodwill would be recognized. So he says, uh, if I'm an analyst and of course, uh, I've also studied for CFA level one. So I know that when I'm looking at balance sheet of a company, the plant is shown at carrying value, which is acquisition cost minus accumulated depreciation. So how is that a limitation? So imagine uh, I give you a balance sheet of LNT. You are being asked to do valuation of the assets and there is a shipbuilding plant or a hydrocarbon plant which is in Chennai. So you are being asked to do a valuation. Wouldn't have it, have it been easier had all the values been shown at fair value? Yes or no? So from an equity analyst perspective, maybe yes, but not for everyone. So <clears throat> the fact that all the assets come at different measurement base and therefore it increases the complexity. This is why it's being referred to as limitations. Correct, yes. So again, when we say it, acqu acquisition cost minus accumulated depreciation, firms can manipulate by either charging too much or too less. Same is the case here with respect to impairment. In fact, it can happen with almost every item on the balance sheet. Should we go ahead now?